Robert Higgs, we were just looking at some of your favorite books. One of them is the Holy Bible, King James Version. Why the King James Version? Uh, because I love the language. Uh, I think it's a magnificent work of poetry. And uh, I think even if you're not the least bit religious, uh, you have to recognize that uh, that particular Bible as one that's had enormous uh, effects on not only Western culture, but its language, its uh, turns of phrase. Uh, it's just uh, impossible to imagine the, the past 400 years uh, without that Bible. It's had such a, a, a deep and wide uh, effect on, on the culture of the West. And H. L. Mencken, <laughs> why? Oh, I, I love Mencken in every way. Of course, his, his, his language is always rousing and uh, uh, he goes beyond provocative. Uh, he's always trying to jab someone. Uh, but, uh, but Mencken, although he's uh, often credited as a rousing writer, uh, I think was actually a very deep thinker as well, and he's not often credited for that. I think he, he had uh, uh, very much figured out how the world works, and uh, unlike many uh, stodgy professors, he was able to express his observations in a very engaging way. Do you think that you and H.L. Mencken would agree on political issues? Uh, we'd certainly agree on a great many of them. Uh, I don't know whether there's something we would disagree on. There might be, but uh, I think I would have a great deal of agreement with Mink. And I, I wish he were here today. We need him. We are back to taking your phone calls with Robert Higgs, our guest for In-Depth this month, Uniontown, Pennsylvania. Thanks for holding your on the air. Hi. Thanks for taking my call. Hi, Professor Higgs. Um, um, we're going to start. Uh, Greed um, basically means wanting or taking more than one needs. But uh, in the business world, um, you have profit maximization, which means getting as much as you can. And I would see that that was even more virulent than greed. Okay, so we go to that sterile environment, and then you add to that the deregulation that started under the Carter administration that allowed for the SNL crisis. And uh, you had deregulation that happened at the end of uh, Carter administration. Uh, you had the Graham Leach Bliley Act and the Commodity Futures Modification Act, which allowed for things like Enron and our present crises. Uh, what do you think about deregulation? Uh, the more of it, the merrier. Uh, I would like to see everything deregulated. Because if everything were deregulated, then there would be a very strong incentive for people to be careful. For example, people wouldn't simply uh, put their deposits in a bank unless they had some information about the safety and the management of that bank. Uh, people would not simply buy securities uh, relying on some assurance that the Securities and Exchange Commission has looked over the security and uh, given it some seal of approval. Every time the government regulates something, it creates a false sense of security and leads people to neglect the kind of care that they ought to be giving to the management of their own affairs. Now, of course, when something goes wrong, uh, the tendency is then to turn around and blame it on uh, deregulation, if any, if any has occurred. Uh, but this presumes that if we only regulated everything, then the world would be hunky-dory. But in fact, if we regulated everything severely so that we got rid of every risk, the world would be a nightmare. Uh, we rely on the fact that people have scope for risk-taking, and we rely on uh, the, the fact that people will take measures to, to protect their own interests. And uh, the idea that somehow we can rely on these government employees uh, as if they cared about us as a mother hen cares about her chicks uh, is something that hi historical evidence shows <laughs> is verging on a joke. Uh, these regulators very often are in bed with the people they regulate, uh, very often looking forward to a lucrative job in the industry they're regulating after they leave the regulatory agency. Very often people who came from the industry they're regulating uh, before uh, serving for a time on a regulatory agency and then returning to the industry, there's a revolving door 
that's uh, very well documented. And uh, I, I think it's simply a kind of childishness to expect that we can rely on these overseers in the government to do the right thing and to protect us from uh, behaving foolishly or rationally or unwisely. We can't do that. We know we can't do that from the way uh, the historical events have taken place in the past. Paul from Tallahassee, Alabama emails in, some government agencies, EPA, USDA, FDA, use methods of calculating the economic cost per estimated life saved to justify economically sensible thresholds of enforcement on public safety issues. Why shouldn't we now insist Homeland Security apply the same method and start estimating the unit costs of measures for saving lives and properties from terrorism and other forms of state insecurity? Well, uh, I, I would uh, not consider that an improvement. Uh, Homeland Security is uh, something that could scarcely get any worse managed in my judgment, but this might be one way to do it. These, uh, these agency calculations that uh, purport to use the, the value of lives saved are extremely controversial at best. Uh, in fact, all the kinds of studies that government agencies do uh, to justify their actions uh, are, are extremely iffy. Uh, besides being a professor, I've uh, been a consultant from time to time over the years. Uh, in regulatory matters, and so I have a, a certain amount of first-hand exposure to the sorts of studies government cooks up and relies on and puts forward to justify its policy actions. And uh, uh, I can tell you, you wouldn't want to bet the farm on the intellectual integrity of these exercises. They're, uh, they're shoddy at best, and uh, they're often completely worthless. So, so uh, in a sense, it seems in the abstract that that yes, uh, using cost-benefit studies to, to uh, decide which government actions are better and which are worse uh, might move us in the right direction. And it's conceivable that occasionally it, it does. But uh, I have little faith in the ability to divert government from what it's really trying to do, which is uh, help its friends, hurt its enemies, and, and line somebody's pockets. And in fact, in one of your books, you take on the FDA. And I can't find it right now, but what do you say about the FDA? Well, I, I spent a number of years studying the FDA. It was my major research interest for uh, several years during the mid-1990s especially, and I've followed it to some extent ever since. Uh, I think the FDA is probably better than any other government agency, an example of fraud. The FDA purports to use scientific uh, studies and, and scientific information and scientific decision making uh, in order to make sure that no one places on the market uh, products, uh, uh, drugs, uh, medical devices, other products that are unsafe or ineffective for their uh, indicated usage. Uh, this is something of a joke, and everybody who reads the newspapers ought to know it. Uh, can you say Vioxx? Uh, can you say any number of other drugs that have been approved by the FDA and yet turned out to be immensely harmful? So the FDA's uh, so-called gold standard seal of approval is as bogus as any uh, gold standard seal could get. Uh, again, this has given people a false sense of security. Uh, they feel that they're, they're protected when they're really not. But at the same time, uh, because of the incentives uh, FDA uh, uh, bureaucrats have uh, to not place a, a Vioxx-type product on the market, uh, their typical procedure is to be very, very cautious, slow, demand more uh, information, more studies, and as a result, uh, products that uh, are uh, potentially extremely useful and valuable uh, in uh, relieving disease and saving lives uh, are, are often held off the market for 10 to 15 years awaiting FDA approval. Uh, this is a tragedy. It's the kind of uh, regulation that has cost, uh, it seems likely, hundreds of thousands of excess deaths and countless amounts of human suffering in this country. So. Uh, unfortunately, the public uh, believes in the FDA more than it believes in almost any other government agency, 
and it's extremely unfortunate that it does so because this has been a lethal regulatory agency. 202 is the area code, 737 for those of you in the east and central time zones, 202 Western and Pacific time zones, Book TV at cspan.org is our email address for our in-depth guest, Robert Higgs, Jackson, Wyoming. Thanks for holding. You're on. Yes, thank you for taking my call. Uh, I'm, I'm telling you, the hair at the back of my neck is standing up listening to you. Uh, number one, you're a Bible reader. You know, uh, what's the Bible say? A rich man has as much chance to get into the gates of heaven as a camel does get into an ivory needle. And, and as for regulations, you don't believe in the speed of it. But that's not my point. My point is you keep saying the banks are, uh, are responsible, AGI are responsible. These are human beings in these corporations that are responsible. And if there was a law of treason, these people have done more to harm this country than Ben Laden did and, he, and the world. And if these people were gathered up and charged with treason, that, this is the thing. You have the uh, tobacco company go in front of Congress and raise their hand and swear that cigarettes didn't cause cancer. And then they had to come back and admit that they were that they lied, and then they they then they would find billions of dollars, and then they raised the tobacco products to charge the people they got addicted to the product to, to pay for their addiction, and nobody in in those corporations got uh, sent to prison for lying to Congress. The situation are laws of, uh, for the rich. You sir are fascists. You believe that the the, the uh, corporations are able to rule. This is supposed to be a government of the people, by the people. This is now a government for the, for the corporations, by the corporations. Uh, I think you weren't listening earlier. Uh, I haven't said anything uh, in the way of kind words toward corporations using government power to feather their nests. Uh, I'm completely opposed to that. I'm opposed to anyone's using government power to feather his nest, whether he's a low-income person or a powerful corporation. Uh, my conception of what the government ought to be doing is so limited that it verges on the government's total evaporation. So when big corporations use the government, uh, that's the fascism you're thinking about, uh, I'm entirely opposed to that. Now, what people frequently forget is when they create government power, somebody is going to have an incentive to seize it. And exactly what interests do you think will have that power? Do you think it's going to be poor people who run the government? Or do you think it's going to be powerful corporate interests that are able to seize and use government power for their own purposes? Uh, people are very naive when they look to government to save the little guy without realizing that it's not the way government operates. Government purports to help the little guy. This is good campaign talk. This is good political rhetoric. But government is not beholden to the little guy. Uh, government is beholden to all those interest groups organized for su supporting politicians for office and keeping them there. So if, if we find that government officials are in bed with corporate interests, we shouldn't be shocked. We should say that's exactly what we should expect. Uh, the way to get rid of that problem is to take power away from government. If government didn't have the power to to regulate products, then the producers of those products wouldn't be paying off politicians to win their favor for the kinds of regulations that will work best for them. So I, we need to get realistic about the nature of government and how it operates. Uh, to, to look to it and say uh, it's in the hands of evil men, uh, of course it's in the hands of evil men. What did you expect would happen when you created government power? That, that do-gooders would come forth in masses and run the government? Uh, that's not the nature of the thing. Remember, it's force. Government is organized coercion. And when you have that kind of power available, it creates an enormous magnetic attraction for the most unscrupul un uh, 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 unscrupulous interests in society. It's, a, it's like a loaded gun lying there waiting for someone to pick it up and use it for illicit purposes. So create a loaded gun at your own peril. Vincent, Bo Vincent in Boston emails, Dr. Higgs says he does not support corporate bailouts, but he is evading the fact that a natural result of completely free markets and minimal government regulation is the growth of these too big to fail entities. 
is he saying that the systemic risk of letting these entities fail, as predicted by large numbers of economists and academia and government, is a fraudulent argument? Uh, I am saying it's a, an almost fraudulent argument. Uh, uh, we've heard a great deal of talk in the past nine months about systemic risk. And the idea here, uh, for those who don't follow this discussion, is that uh, if we have a large institution such as AIG fail, it has so many interconnections with other uh, large institutions and, and, and they have so many interconnections with others and so forth that uh, the failure of one big institution will drag down the whole world. Uh, this is an allegation more than an, an established scientific fact. And in fact, uh, uh, the best study I've seen of systemic risk, which was published uh, a couple of years ago in the Journal of Financial Economics, found that systemic risk is a very, very small risk, almost negligible risk. Uh, but it's a very fine political lever because politicians can come out and say, look, I know you people don't like the fact that we're, we're wrenching money away from you and giving it to these uh, big financial organizations, but we have to do it because if we don't do it, your whole world is going to go to hell. Uh, that makes a great story. Uh, perhaps some of these politicians even believe it, but uh, there's no reason for us to believe it. Uh, there's no foundation for it. Uh, if, if we don't let big institutions go bankrupt, then we've simply changed the nature of our system. We've changed it from a market system, a system of profit and loss, into a system of private profit and socialized loss, which is a real fascist type system. And I, I'm sorry to see that the actions the government has taken in the past nine months move us a, a considerable distance in that direction. And uh, I, I say it's time to perform an experiment. Let some of these big institutions find their own way out of the trouble. If they can't do it, it's the market's way of, of telling them that they're not worth saving. If they're not worth saving, then why are we taking money from taxpayers to save something that isn't worth saving? Uh, I think it's a fraud to bring up systemic risk every time the government goes to bail out some of its friends in big financial institutions. Greenwood, South Carolina, you're on with Robert Higgs. Ah, good morning. Thank you for C-SPAN. Um, Mr. Higgs, I, I, I'm confused. You seem to enjoy the benefits of the government and the country, but at the same time, you want to bite that hand that feeds you. Um, you didn't answer the woman's question earlier when she asked you, would you give back your Social Security if you were taking it? Um, well, you, since you're not on it, when you become eligible, will you take it? Um, would you go so far as to not drive on public roads that were built by the government? And would you go so far as to give back your land that you own back to the Native Americans who were here before the government seized their property? Um, where does this thing end? It seems a very reptilian type of mentality. Thank you. <laughs> well, as I said before, once you live in a world that is pervaded by government influences, uh, where the government has built almost all the roads, where the government has taken money from people, including from me since 1958, for Social Security taxes, uh, to ask people at that point, to forswear the use or uh, the benefit that was promised them in exchange for their having uh, paid taxes and obeyed rules for an entire lifetime uh, is not exactly a good test of anyone's sincerity and certainly not a good test of his reptilianism. Uh, if, if we had a starting point again and we could say, Let's start here and uh, allow people to manage their own affairs voluntarily, peacefully, and cooperatively, and work on that basis. Yes, certainly, I would want to start there. It's not an option for us at this point to start there. We can't efface a world that has been shaped and damaged and directed for centuries by government intrusion that ought never to have occurred. So here's where we find ourselves. We find ourselves in a cesspool. And uh, we can swim in, in the contents of that cesspool, or we can sink. Uh, if someone wants to ask me to sink because I find myself in a cesspool, I can only say I think that's an unreasonable request. I'm going to try to stay afloat in this world. I don't like the shape it's been put in. 
but I didn't put it in this shape. I didn't take anything from Native Americans. So I don't know that there's a, a, a particular Native American person to whom I've committed an injustice. This is a tricky issue. If you go back in history, you find that everybody's ancestors were abused and subjected to robbery and violence at some point. Does that mean that we're all in the debt of everybody, everywhere? Uh, this is a, a, a very easy and cheap way of thinking about the course of history. And it doesn't really work. When we, when we uh, wrong someone, uh, there's the po possibility of restitution. Uh, but there's no possibility for me to make restitution uh, for uh, the people who were slain at, at Wounded Knee by the U.S. Army. I can't give them their lives back. But at the same time, we need to recognize that I didn't take their lives either. I'm not responsible for what generations before me did. And they did a great deal of wrong. But right now, the generation that I'm a part of is doing a great deal of wrong. And for that, I can raise my voice. I can denounce injustice. I can try to uh, move the world in a better direction. Uh, I can't take responsibility for every historical wrong ever done. Robert Higgs is our in-depth guest this month, Phoenix, Arizona. Good afternoon. Phoenix. Hello, um, Robert Higgs. Thank you very much for the education. First time I've heard you. I hear a lot of callers here asking the government to take care of them. This country was founded on individual liberty and the right to go out and earn a lot of money and have freedom. We're losing that freedom on a daily basis. There is a congressman called Ron Paul, who is a Republican, and he has a campaign for liberty, trying to promote your ideals. He is trying to audit the Federal Reserve, which has a grip on our economy. It seems they don't want to answer where the $700 billion went, or they have an unlimited checkbook to do whatever they want, and they're taxing us for it. If you'd like to join the Campaign for Liberty, please go to CampaignForLiberty.com and help Congressman Ron Paul pass a new bill he just wrote called H.R. 1207. And if you do know of Ron Paul, can you please comment on him and his ideals? Thank you. Uh, I know Dr. Paul, and uh, I, uh, I certainly share many of uh, the ideals that uh, he promotes. So uh, I'm happy to, to say a kind word in Dr. Dr. Paul's favor. Uh, I think he's uh, attempting to move the country in the right direction, and uh, I wish him every success in doing so. And if you'd like to get in touch with our guest, Robert Higgs, you can go to the website independentinstitute.org. It's a .org, correct? Yes. And Larry Sasser emails in, you focus on government taking our freedoms. I believe our founders did a pretty good job of protecting us from government. We do have the ability to get rid of bad actors in the government. Not a perfect system, but that will come when people are become perfect. Our founders did not know about corporations and did not foresee their potential power, so did not protect us from them. Corporations now have the most uh, benefits of citizenship without most of the constraints. I fear corporate control of my life far more than government control. Well, that's an interesting point of view, and it's certainly a one that many people uh, have. Uh, I think it's misguided. Uh, to my recollection, uh, uh, no corporation uh, forces anyone to buy its product. Uh, uh, Walmart does not hold a gun to my head when I go in to patronize the store. Uh, if I chose to stop patronizing Walmart, I'd simply walk away from the store, and that would be the end of the story. Uh, likewise with other corporations. The corporations have only as much power as they wield through government. Corporations didn't run the Holocaust. Corporations weren't running Pol Pot's regime. Corporations were not running Stalinist Russia. Governments were running these, these, the, these abominable places. And when we see great crimes being committed, uh, we're seeing the work of government in every instance. Private individuals don't have the means to, to mount huge massacres. Corporations don't have the means uh, or, or the power to carry out these great crimes. Only governments have the means, and often, sad to say, they have the incentive to carry out great crimes. So the idea that you're more afraid of a, 
a corporation then, or of corporations uh, as a group than you are of government, uh, I, I think just simply does not comport with the way corporations and governments have behaved in the past. Uh, we're talking about the organized uh, control of violence when we talk about government. When we talk about corporations, we're talking about firms that uh, will last only so long as people choose to do business with them. Unless, of course, the government uses its coercive power to come along and bail them out when private individuals no longer want to support them, uh, as the government is now doing for many of these big financial institutions. So uh, we need to draw a distinction between where the real danger lies because of the control of violent force in governments uh, and where relatively limited danger lies because we have competition, because we have somewhere else to go, because uh, we're not at the mercy uh, of a corporation or of corporations as a group. Now, having said that, uh, I certainly believe it's quite obvious that many corporations have extremely large amounts of clout with the government. Uh, I, I was talking a while ago about the revolving door, about the way uh, individuals go in and out of government service. Uh, it's, it's most notorious with the Department of Defense, but it happens across the board in government, uh, and this is simply a way of demonstrating that in a government that's got a lot of power, particularly regulatory power or large spending power, it's going to attract interest groups, firms uh, that hope to benefit from some form of government privilege. But it's the government privilege that attracts them. If government were smaller, if it didn't exercise these functions, there would be no attraction there and people would have to compete in an open market. So I, 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 I simply think it's a, a, a big mistake for people to, to fear the corporations as such. Uh, they're not dangerous. What's dangerous is the corporation allied with and making use of government's coercive force. Ithaca, New York. Uh, yes, uh, Professor Higgs, uh, I have a comment followed by a uh, question about the economy. First of all, there are many people who work for little, than more, little more than minimum wage their entire lives. Today, there are many households where both parents have to work just to make ends meet. It's never been an equal playing field out there. So I am in favor of the government helping people with Social Security and other programs. Now, my question. Um, General Eisenhower warned about the military-industrial complex becoming too powerful. How much of our economy is dependent on the success of the military-industrial complex and do you see an inherent danger in this dependency? Thank you, caller. Uh, a substantial part of our economy is tied to the military-industrial complex. I usually call it the military-industrial congressional complex to uh, indicate the essential role that Congress uh, has come to play in this, uh, uh, this arrangement or this set of institutions that uh, we refer to with that, that name. Uh, the, the MIC, this military industrial congressional complex, uh, emerged in, in its uh, current form uh, from World War II. Uh, it really uh, got many of its powers and its uh, forms actually before the United States entered the war as a uh, declared belligerent. But, but certainly during World War II, the, the military complex became enormous, and then after World War II, it was never cut back to its pre-war uh, dimensions. Uh, and uh, particularly from the time of the Korean War onward, it's been a major drain. Uh, I did a study uh, some years ago that found that uh, between 1948 and uh, 1989, when the Cold War ended, a, a period there of more than four decades, that, that on the average, uh, the military uh, was receiving about 7.6% uh, of uh, the gross domestic product. Now, uh, that didn't take into account all of these additional kinds of uh, actual military costs I mentioned earlier in the program that are not categorized as military spending, but actually are. So we could magnify that amount considerably if we took those left out factors into account. Now, this means that the military is a big deal economically. 
Uh, it's not as big now, of course, as it was during World War II, uh, but it's still substantial, and the people who occupy uh, leading positions in it, whether it's in industry or in the Defense Department or the administration, uh, make uh, powerful decisions that, that shape uh, important parts of our economic life. In particular, they've had a very disproportionate uh, role in, in uh, sponsoring and financing research and development. Uh, for a long time, most of the R&D uh, in this country was connected with the military and funded by the military, and there's still a great deal of that kind of research and development going on today. What this has meant is that, among other things, the, uh, the technology that's developed in this country has been shaped with an eye to, to military uses rather than uses that would be profitable in the market because they're uses that serve the interests of consumers. Sometimes there are spillovers. Things that are developed for military purposes can also be turned to valuable civilian uses. But that kind of spillover has been greatly exaggerated. And in general, if you set out to create a better weapon, that's what you're going to, to create, not uh, something that's very valuable for civilian purposes. So, so the military has, has been a major economic uh, factor. It's, it's still a major economic factor today. Uh, earlier in the program, uh, I suggested uh, a rule of thumb, which would place uh, the military share of uh, GDP in the neighborhood of 8% right now, rather than the 4% that's uh, ascribed to the Department of Defense alone. But, uh, but in any event, it's important. It continues to be important, and probably more so than its importance for, uh, for the economy directly is its importance in shaping U.S. foreign policy because uh, the, the, the people who run the, uh, the MIC are very much engaged uh, in, uh, in making and implementing foreign policy. And uh, one, of the, one of the most unfortunate developments in the United States since World War II has been uh, the U.S. operation as a, as a chronic interventionist in the world. And uh, not just an interventionist using <coughs> economic resources, uh, but uh, military interventionists. We've had these uh, wars in Korea, wars in, in uh, Iraq, wars in Vietnam, wars in Afghanistan, and we've had a great variety of military interventions of smaller scale elsewhere in the world. We have more than 700 foreign military bases right now scattered all over the world and a huge navy cruising every ocean in the world. So the United States is almost omnipresent militarily in the world. And this has been uh, not just economically, but politically an extremely unfortunate uh, development because uh, the operation of this de facto empire has changed the nature of American government. Uh, it's, uh, it's not only impoverished the American people, uh, but, it's, uh, but it's caused a great, great deal of unnecessary death and destruction around the world. So it's certainly to be regretted, uh, not, not simply for economic uh, reasons. And if you would like to read more about what Dr. Higgs says about the military-industrial congressional complex, depression, war, and cold war, he writes rather extensively about it in there. To go to that caller's first point in Against Leviathan, mm -hmm. you write, societal distribution of income is morally neutral. Everything hinges on why the distribution changes. Uh, yes, I, I certainly believe that. There's, there's been a lot of study and a lot of uh, policy uh, discussion based on, uh, on what people take the distribution of income to be. And, and I've made a number of points about that over the years. One is that we don't really know what the distribution is. We have these data the government collects, and they tell us something, but they're highly imperfect. Uh, we know many reasons to, to suspect strongly suspect that there are substantial errors in those data. Not everybody is going to reveal all his sources of income. Uh, some of it is criminal in its origin, for example. Some of it people simply don't want to let out because they're afraid of the tax collector and so forth. Uh, some people just think it's nobody else's business how much income they have. So, so there are many sources of error in the data used to represent the distribution of income. But even if the data were perfect, uh, we, we have so many reasons to, to uh, conclude that, uh, that 
some people have a lot more income than others for altogether legitimate reasons, as I was saying earlier. They work more. Uh, they get more education. They get more training. Uh, they move to places that have more opportunity. They take all kinds of actions to invest in what economists call their human capital. And the payoff to that investment comes in the form of reaping a higher stream of income uh, as a result. So, so the fact that uh, people vary in their income earning capability is the most natural thing in the world. The, the grotesque thing would be if we all had the same income. And it would not only be grotesque, but it would be horrible because the only way we could ever bring about that situation would be by the exercise uh, uh, of absolutely diabolical government force. This would verge on the sort of actions taken by the Pol Pot regime in Cambodia, where they tried to take everybody who had an education and herd him out to be a rice farmer alongside people who had no education. This was their notion of equal equality. Uh, and yes, if you exert enough force, you can bring about equality, but you also create hell on earth in the process. Now, I'm not suggesting that every measure taken to uh, equalize income distribution uh, it, it reeks of uh, Pol Pot type uh, decisions. Uh, that's certainly not the case. But uh, at the same time, uh, if we punish people for earning more, we have to realize that that's going to have repercussions. It's going to reduce the incentive for people to do productive things. And to some extent, we do punish people for earning more through the tax system. <clears throat> and we also reward people for earning less, which creates the other incentive. It creates an incentive for people to get themselves into a position where they won't have much income, but can expect uh, to rely on the government to give them some form of assistance. Now, uh, whenever one discusses this, the, the kind of comment that uh, comes forth tends to be, well, but we have these people uh, who rely on government for, uh, to keep, keep their heads above water. And certainly we do. We have millions of people in that position. But it does not mean that without government measures to assist them, no one would assist them. If we say that, we're making a terrible statement about what kind of human beings we are. We're saying we would not personally help out our neighbor in trouble. Well, if that's the kind of people we are, and some of us get elected to government, are we going to be any better there when we're not only bad people, but bad people with government power in addition? I think that only compounds the problem. A lot of the, the, the uh, government measures that are taken uh, to supposedly help poor people are frauds. Yes, they create dependencies. Yes, they put people in a position to continually support the kinds of politicians that promise that assistance. But these have been terrible for people in many ways. They've actually uh, changed people's character for the worst. When people were more self-reliant in this country, which they were historically, uh, they were, in that way, better people. Uh, they helped one another. Nowadays, everybody waits for the government to do it. This is not a good way for human beings to make themselves better people. Los Angeles, you're on with Robert Higgs. My question is the Great Depression, its causes, and more importantly, the reason it ended. Yesterday on my favorite um, channel, Book TV, Burton Folsom gave a lecture about his new book on the New Deal, which I believe you list as reading, in which he stated that you felt that the reason the Great Depression ended was not what most people think, uh, the World War II, but actually the aftermath of World War II, the death of Roosevelt, and the legislation that came about. Uh, I wanted you to elaborate on that point. Thank you. Well, this is a, uh, uh, an area of research I've been pursuing for uh, 20 years or so, and uh, my most important findings are in my book, a Depression, War, and Cold War. So uh, if you want the full story, I recommend that book. But to, uh, to just give you a hint of the, the kind of argument I developed there, the, uh, the Depression certainly was not over in 1940, say, uh, when uh, the government began to be reshaped for war purposes. Uh, after mid-1940, uh, the administration uh, took uh, greater and greater actions to prepare the country for war, including uh, in September 1940, the initiation of a military draft. So from mid-1940 onward, uh, uh, to a greater and greater extent, the economy is being uh, moved away from the civilian use of goods and services uh, to military use. And eventually, by the time we get to the war peak in 1944, 
uh, we've got about four tenths of the whole U.S. economy uh, being devoted to military purposes. Now, uh, pe people often say, in fact, uh, almost everybody believes, even most economists believe, uh, that uh, the war got the economy out of the Depression. And what I've argued in my work is that this is a misunderstanding of what we mean by getting out of a depression. Yes, unemployment disappeared during the war. There's no doubt about it. It reached the lowest levels ever measured, just a little more than 1% uh, by 1944. Uh, but why did unemployment disappear? Well, overwhelmingly for one single reason, the draft. If you start with five or six million people unemployed and then you draft 10 million people and create an incentive for millions of others to enlist before they get drafted and end up in the infantry, then yes, you will get rid of unemployment. It's a surefire way to do it. Uh, and that's what happened during World War II. Now at the same time, because so many people were uh, drawn away from the civilian labor force, uh, others came in to replace them in, in the production lines. And uh, lots of uh, women who had never worked in the paid labor force before went to work. Uh, teenagers dropped out of school and went to work. Uh, older people who had retired came out of retirement, went back to work. So, so these uh, men were replaced in, in the labor force uh, and production was able to proceed without them. But uh, if you look at the kind of production that grew during the war, what you find is that this is not a regular business cycle boom at all. In fact, after 1941, civilian goods and services production declined and never got back to its 1941 level until 1946, after the war had ended. So there, 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 there was certainly no prosperity during the war. Uh, the many important civilian goods were rationed. Uh, there were all sorts of rules to tell people what they could and couldn't do. Uh, gasoline was a very hard to get. Public transportation was limited and preempted by military authorities. Uh, the list goes on and on. If, if this is your idea of prosperity, you have a very perverse idea of prosperity. It wasn't that. It was a full employment situation because of the draft and the military buildup. It was a, a situation in which a great uh, a mountain of goods and services were, were being produced, but they, they were weapons and and munitions and other uh, goods and services aimed at uh, maintaining, supporting, training, transporting military forces. And so the U.S. was a, a command economy uh, devoted to military purposes during the war. Uh, after the war, when the uh, demobilization took place, uh, more than uh, uh, 10 million men were released from the armed forces in the first year after uh, the war ended. Uh, then real prosperity returned because the government gave up this huge claim it had on resources during the war and allowed them to go back into civilian use again, uh, which they did very quickly and very smoothly. Even though many economists, particularly the young Keynesians of the day who had been prominent during the war and claimed their theories had been validated by the war boom, uh, they all expected that the Depression would uh, resume at the, at the end of the war because the government was moving from a huge deficit in its budget uh, to very quickly to a surplus in its budget and reducing its overall expenditures by uh, about 70 percent quite quickly. This seemed like a Keynesian recipe for plunging the economy into a, a, a renewed depression, but that didn't happen. In fact, the economy uh, uh, performed spectacularly in 1946-47 the unemployment rate stayed below 4% during those years, uh, and the transition was made very smoothly as government gave up most of its wartime uh, rules, regulation, and uh, resource command and released uh, uh, men from the armed forces. So, so what we saw there was, in fact, a, a, a tremendous uh, refutation of uh, basic Keynesian thinking. Unfortunately, the Keynesians remembered what they took to be the validation of their model during the war buildup and totally ignored its refutation by what happened at the end of the war. And uh, I've been trying for years to make people look at both ends of uh, the experience during the war 
and also to appreciate uh, above all that that war and prosperity were not linked even during World War II. Uh, just getting rid of unemployment by uh, putting people in the armed forces involuntarily uh, is, a, is a horrible way to deal with a depression. And in his book, Neither Liberty Nor Safety, Robert Higgs writes, in ways big and small, direct and indirect, crude and subtle, war, the quintessential government activity, has been the mother's milk for the nourishment of a growing tyranny in this country, and it remains so today. How, how does that apply to the current Iraq war? Well, I think wh when, whenever we have the government uh, at war, as we do now, although it's an odd kind of war, it's uh, certainly not the kind of war we had during World War II, but whenever the government goes to war, uh, it has an excuse for doing uh, uh, outrageous things. For example, it, it's used the excuse of the, of the wars and the related war on terror uh, to basically gut the Constitution's Bill of Rights. Uh, the, we thought we had a Fourth Amendment to protect us from uh, warrantless search and seizure, but the government has informed us in recent years that we don't have any Fourth Amendment protection. In fact, that the government will spy on us however, whenever it wishes and get away with it because uh, no one will do anything to stop it. The, uh, the courts won't stop it effectively. It just goes on doing it. So uh, our right to privacy has been egregiously violated and gutted by the government on grounds that this was a war necessity, that the government needed uh, to spy on everybody in order to make sure that terrorism uh, didn't uh, uh, occur in our midst again. Uh, it's, a, it's the most outrageous kind of exploitation of the fear that uh, goes along with war and other forms of national emergency. So this would be just one example, but there are a great many others. Uh, the government has increased its, uh, its budget size hugely uh, since 2001. Much of this was excused on the grounds that, that the government had to spend more to respond uh, to the threat of terrorism. Uh, this was, for the most part, a bogus uh, excuse because if we look at where the money actually went, uh, a relatively small part of it actually went uh, to purposes that have anything to do with combating terrorism. And in fact, uh, an enormous amount of it went to the welfare state, uh, which was a kind of deal between the uh, Bush administration and the Democrats so that everybody would be cut in on the government's growth during this, this period of uh, very rapid economic growth. Uh, excused by the necessity of war. Wilmington, Delaware, please go ahead. Yes, uh, Mr. R I'm, I'm thoroughly enjoying your, uh, <clears throat> your interview here. Uh, wh what I want to ask you is uh, basically two things. One, what in your opinion, just in your opinion, is the, how the government is going to handle the enormous, huge deficit that uh, Social Security and Medicare has uh, to handle uh, in the next, you know, 20, 30, 40 years, uh, there's a difference of something in the area of 40 to 70 trillion dollars, and we just simply don't have that kind of money. Uh, so how do you think that they will end up handling it? The other thing is a lot of people think that uh, China and Russia are going to be great military powers in the next, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 years, whatever. And I maintain I don't think that's going to happen because of their population. There are going to be two countries of old people um, because of their uh, birth rates, similar to the situation in France and Italy. But that's uh, what I'd like to ask you about. Mm -hmm. Well, your first question about how the government is going to handle the, uh, uh, the growing uh, expenses for Social Security and uh, Medicare in particular, but there are other programs that are, are similar in their uh, future projections, uh, these are the two big ones. Uh, the, the government will, will not do what it cannot do. <laughs> so what we know for sure right now, there have been a number of careful studies of this matter, and what we know for sure is that uh, the government will not be able to, to make the payments it has promised to make uh, under existing uh, rules and regulations of the, of the Medicare uh, program and the Social Security program. So we know that it's going to do less. It's not going to provide all the, uh, all the benefits that it's promised to provide. 
Uh, I think it will do this in a, in, in a number of ways. Uh, first of all, I think the adjustments the government makes will be piecemeal, gradual. Uh, little by little, the government will make changes. It's already moved to some extent in that direction. For example, the uh, retirement age uh, has been raised uh, a little bit for Social Security. Uh, people who were born when I was born uh, cannot retire with full Social Security benefits until they're 66 years old rather than 65 as previously. And then there are further adjustments already programmed to raise the retirement age. This uh, gets government out of some of its uh, uh, spending obligations because each year that you withhold benefits, more and more of those people die before ever receiving any benefits. And that's a fiscally good deal for the government because uh, unlike uh, the situation, if you, if you die and have saved money to take care of yourself in your old age, and you, you die before retirement, then there's a legacy left to your heirs. But if you, you're expecting the Social Security pension in your old age and you die, uh, there's no legacy at all. Uh, it's just money the government won't be paying out. So uh, every time the government pushes out the age of eligibility, uh, eligibility it uh, saves itself some money, and I expect it'll push that farther and farther. Each time it does it, it'll, it'll tell us how much healthier we are and how we're living longer and old, old people don't need to retire at 65 anymore. They should keep working and pay Social Security taxes longer. But uh, that'll be one way to do it. Uh, but there'll be other ways. Uh, for example, what's given with the right hand will be taken back with the left. And that also has already begun to some extent. Some Social Security benefits are taxed uh, for some people. So uh, on income equal, equality grounds, the government will take back from higher income people through taxation some of what it's giving, given them as a social security benefits. Uh, similarly for Medicare, which is a much bigger deal uh, fiscally, uh, a government will, will simply withhold benefits. It'll cut back on what it provides. Uh, it can't possibly provide all the kinds of services it's providing to people on Medicare now. So it will move further and further in the direction of de facto rationing. And in fact, I expect some form of national health care to be implemented in this country within the next few years. I think it's a disastrous development, but a great many people want it. And as H.L. Mencken used to say about democracy, it's the theory that the people know what they want and deserve to get it good and hard. So I think when uh, we have a national health system in this country, people are going to get it good and hard, just the way they've been getting it in uh, Great Britain uh, since World War II, uh, in Canada uh, for a long time now, and in other countries. Uh, the, these kinds of uh, national promises to give everybody gold-plated health care uh, don't work. They don't pan out. And what uh, they de deliver instead so that the government can stay within its budget constraints is uh, various forms of rationing care, including, uh, in Great Britain, for example, simply withholding various forms of care from older people on the grounds that they don't have long to live anyhow, so it's not cost-effective to uh, use health re uh, resources for them. Uh, let's uh, preserve them uh, to be directed toward the care of younger people. Uh, this kind of, this kind of uh, inhumanity in what purports to be a humane system is, is extremely common, and we can expect to see that in this country, too. I would like to say that we, we have the possibility of not going there, of not adopting a national health care system in this country, but I'm just resigned to the fact that, that uh, a great many Americans favor this, they support it politically, and uh, I believe the Obama administration uh, will try hard to move us in that direction, and I won't be surprised if they succeed. We have one hour left with our guest, Robert Higgs, and if you don't get the chance to talk to him or email him in the next hour, you can always contact him at theindependentinstitute.org is the w email address. If you're on hold, hang on. We'll be right back.